police yet to establish motive for supermarket gunfight. Tighter security expected in NCD from the 24th. And Pomio District and its tourism potential. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining me for Tuesday's news. Investigations into the Barocco Food World supermarket shooting are into its third stage, with police already interviewing witnesses. While the identities of the two Filipinos cannot be released at this stage, police say they are yet to establish a motive. The Food World shootout occurred on the evening of last Thursday. Police say two security guards, both expatriates, were involved in an argument which led to a gun battle. Part of the CCTV footage which captured the incident was uploaded on social media and Port Mosby police say the video may not be used as evidence in court. And that's where it will now disrupt my investigation. And I keep telling, uh, don't put such thing upon them. Because when, it, when we go to court, it's already a public not, uh, information. And public opinion is not going to be used for uh, evidence in court. It is reported that one Filipino man shot and killed the other. Two Papua New Guinean children were injured in the crossfire. The incident occurred inside the shopping center. The suspect is facing a willful murder charge and remains in police custody. Police cannot release any further details of the investigation but they say they are working closely with the Philippines Embassy in Port Mosby. Like I said earlier, we'll be um, uh, putting out three charges on the disease and the two that were also hit during the uh, shooting. So there'll be three charges for that uh, uh, suspect. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Port Mosby is expecting a step up in security come Saturday the 24th of this month as members of the Joint Services Task Force engage in security operations for the first APEC senior officials meeting. Representing head of APEC security, ACP Nawa Vanuavaru, said a motorcade dry run was conducted to test security preparations. The motorcade involves the receiving of senior officials from Jackson's International Airport, escorting them to the meeting areas and back to their accommodation venues. Members of the Joint Services Task Force has been preparing for the last 12 months to ensure the safe movement of visiting leaders from one venue to the next. They now have three more days before the start of Psalm 1, which will run from February 24th to March 9th. The exercise this morning is also looking critically at uh, the testing of all the motorcade uh, preparations, that is including the close uh, personal protection. We're also looking at the uh, traffic uh, motorcade uh, arrangements and also testing out any capacity gaps that we might have. Australian Federal Police are spearheading the training and has already provided much of the fleet that will be used in this operation. But PNG Traffic Police are leading these operations. It is divided into four specialized areas. So far, the motorcade team has graduated 40 cyclists, including six women. It needs 40 more. It's a segmented process which requires separate parts. There's motorcycle riding, there's traffic control, there's vehicle driving, and there's close personal protection. Exercises like today are important practice as we lead up to Leaders Week and the other senior officers uh, meetings. Uh, we are expecting in excess of 20 to 25 motorcades for Leaders Week, so this practice to achieve this capability is, is, is significant and is important. But the security of visiting leaders is not limited to safe movements from one venue to the next. JSTF is engaging in providing the additional security 
both on sea and in the air. However, the PNG Defense Force plane, the CASA, remains grounded as it is undergoing maintenance. Those in authority say it will take months before the plane can fly again. Look, at this point in time, there's no firm date, but we're working through things to have it uh, you know, uh, operational as soon as possible. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. A first ever national planning consultative summit will be held next month in Leh, hosted by the Department of National Planning and Monitoring and the Consultative Implementation Monitoring Council or CIMC. The summit will carry the theme Securing Our Future Through Inclusive Economic Growth. Minister Richard Maru says all agreed outcomes and strategies from this summit will go directly into the Medium Term Development Plan 3, which is expected to be driven by various partners like the private sector, development partners and ordinary Papua New Guineans and not just the PNG government alone. A landowner along the Kagamuga Airport four-lane road is demanding an explanation from authorities after his double-story house was removed by construction workers. John Pock said he is out of business after his house and warehouse were wrecked by the four-lane construction. The four-lane road from Kagamuga International Airport to Togoba outside Mount Hagen City is part of the APEC project in the country. John Park had given five meters of his land for the fall-in construction. However, he was caught off guard last week when bulldozers damaged his properties to construct the fall-in road. I'm all asking people along uh, footpath five meter, where people all eastern side line people are one bell and give him. Customary. About about I'm customary land, I'm in a state land, I'm customary land. People are one bell and give him go to government. But now all come on all bagrabbing me. So, me still wait here till all government line back and back now. Talk to one time, people. Mr. Pork said he is happy for development to take place, but giving him a courtesy notice before damaging his properties would have been more appropriate. He said he is not a settler and he can be easily evicted. Mr. Pork lost his business in a newly built home valued up to 60,000 kina. She wanted him something where I'm like uh, bring him come to development block country. And me understand, but government or workman or representative of government, you know, like come down and talk to one the people, like landowners, so that people by one bell na walk by own. Meanwhile, Eastern End Command Deputy Commander Ben Turi urged landowners and settlers to allow the construction of the four-lane road so that it can be completed soon before the APEC meeting. However, Mr. Po complained that part of his land was given already for the fallen road and he said authorities should not claim traditional land without any understanding made. Vasinata Yema, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Kobe landowners are concerned as to why their benefits have not been paid since 2016. Landowners fronted up at the Department of Petroleum office demanding answers. They say a Gulf PDL was paid $1.2 million in the same trust account responsible for the Gobe oil fields. Since 2016, the Gobe landowners have been demanding their payout. They say the payout is not an equity or claim but down payment recognized in the signed agreement between resource owners, the state and the developer. And one project, and that why is the reason Kigure has paid 16th last 2016. Now Mibla wait is one year. Why is the reason? Now, Mila clear Mibla, 40 billion was sell. And this document was sold. Now, you have been hiding some money, going to be put him out now. Now, Papa Brogram, like, take him the rest of the money. Now, me like him, that man, must look, 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 look. Cop say, my name, I call name. Cop say, you're from Southern Island. Help me, Southern Island people. Yes, true. You're the man, you need Southern Island people. I want you to pay that people's money. A peaceful protest to the DP office received no response as securities locked the gates and prohibited the disgruntled landowners to talk to officers. The Gobe landowners say officers handling the process are incompetent. Power who said he hold him? One of them, officer, you hold him. Me like the secretary or minister must 
transfer him this la power you got one blow officer now today all files who said all him me like this files must be transmitted to another officer Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, no, yes, yes. Um, so, who said the officer all himself file? Me talk here. Secretary must come here. Now comes in the file. Law in front of us. And give it to another officer. Law passing his payment. Enough is enough. These faction of Gobelin owners are from Southern Islands and they share borders with those in Gulf. Two weeks ago, the friends from Gulf received 1.2 million as consultancy payment. The money was sourced from the same trust account all beneficiaries of the Gobe oil fields benefit from. Melek Tok Silent, Southern Highlands, Wanda Mela, Kigore, by the person, this is all before the Apex Medin. Across the world. Check it up. We'll close it and make sure that the world is looking at this country is a problem. The landowners have come peacefully but say the next protest is unlikely. They are demanding answers from DPE. Sabos, this is like you black. Stabbing me go down and bang me, sir, me black car for strike candle on this. DP pay him second, third body. Take a legal accident and me can come pass him to the project one time. Department. Thank you. Meanwhile, DPE officers have denied the rumor of forcing landowners to sign a 30% payment for officers to process money owed to the global landowners. Jack Lapave, Junior National MTV News. Over 200 PNG Port Services employees have been made redundant. Workers are complaining that they have been treated unfairly and are calling for negotiations to discuss redundancy packages and possible work options. With 217 employees of Papua New Guinea ports now redundant, it is estimated to affect at least 1,200 Papua New Guineans. Today, employees gathered at the Lalakau FM residence to raise their concern to the media as to why they were suddenly told that they had no jobs. This comes after a new shipping company, International Terminal Container Services Incorporation, took over the port services. Uh, Come, come, na now some company and maybe to pass up. So I'll give him short notice to me fly. It no be no same. I'm the long plan notice to me fly can prepare me fly at that. I'll give short notice to me fly and me fly come to an end now. This la Sunday 18th and me fly got a finish low work. So I stay Monday and me fly start to some casual workers. But me fly no sour. This la job by last day me fly no got. What we are so concerned about is our, is our package, our redundancy package. Uh, we appeal to our, 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 our employer, current employer, port services, to give us a good package, a redundancy package. Now, by about 280 plus staffs by block around walk low street without jobs. This time, by looking at me, I'm a family man, and I'm a family by, I'm all by suffer now. One of the questions raised by the employees was why did Minister for State Enterprise, William Duma, promise that Papua New Guineans would not lose their jobs. William Duma been to Kosem, I'm got, and to Kosem all workers by, all by God work, time, port and pass. But otherwise, I'm, I'm not come up from Mipla. They left us jobless, sir. Huh? Mipla got all family, Mipla sample, Mipla all skill line, sample, I'm, all got all liquid skill, all not got big pla paper, but thing, I'm by God, take him long pla time to find him work. Because um, uh, and this thing come down a lot. Government, you mean? Government of today. I work in this thing, lo bring him, come in a new pla foreign company, and come to stop. Then government, I'm um, work lo talk. All by uh, job secretary, lo me pla, I'm um, um, go past. Even I work lo put in newspaper. So true, true, something, I'm pla, kiss him, me pla, kiss him, I'm me pla, I'll get to lose him work. We find ourselves that we are jobless. So we are going to suffer. Our families too will suffer and we are a bit worried with our future. They say their chances for long-term employment in the Port and Steve Dorin area is not guaranteed and future job security is now at risk. These workers say while there are a lot of issues that still needs to be worked out, they are mindful that they will not be employed for quite some time. Because of these, they are calling on PNG Ports to negotiate compensatory payments 
to cover the loss of future wages and possible future employment opportunities. Spokesperson Daddy Toka Jr. says discussions will be carried out with the local landowners and the International Terminal Container Services to come to an agreement where these employees are not left vulnerable. We don't know what the future holds for them now and, and they're just going to be sent home you know, with all the uh, 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 money that they borrowed that they can't repay now, with all the young children they, they have, they've got to feed. Some of them have poor, poorer families, you know, we're living in, they, you go to Hanobara, there's already poverty in there. Some of them feed and look after those families. Who's going to look after them? The government's not going to sit in. The Motukoita Assembly's not going to sit in. And certainly Tabudubu's not going to sit in. So someone's got to be held accountable for what has happened, what's transpired, because it could have been avoided. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. Among stories ahead in the news, name change for Pacific Place and the tourism potential in the Pomio district of East New Britain. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back to the news. The Pacific Place building in downtown Port Moresby will now be known as MRDC House. This announcement was made with the reopening of the foyer after 12 months of major renovations, which cost MRDC 32 million kina. The building is 25 years old, managed by Pacific Property Trust and owned by landowners from the Kutubu Oil Project. Upgrades include a brand new foyer with reception area, CCTV and access card only system used on entry of the building and lifts. Stage 2 of renovation is currently underway with the upgrading of lifts and construction of a new restaurant on level one. Residents of Gaunagadi Drive are upset over the slow response by NCD authorities. They say despite writing a letter and knocking on doors at the city hall, the city management has not attempted to address their plight. Residents say sewage backflows and poor road engineering has put them at risk of disease and other health hazards every day. Gaunagadi Avenue is situated on sector 255, allotment 7 to 14. The street is next to the Geru 9 Mile Road. This is not the first time MTV has spoken to the residents as they experience flood and sewage backflows during the wet weather. Residents say, despite writing formally to authorities, the response has been very poor. Now, since this date up until now, we have not had a feedback from them, nor any call from the office nor any meeting with them. All they've done so far is sent the engineers here to survey the area. We don't know what the survey is for, but it would be best if they came here themselves. The residents believe the Geru 9 Mile Road has caused all these problems. The stretch of road is also becoming a death trap. Houses are three meters below the road and 10 accidents have happened with an alarming death toll in the past 10 months. Because plenty car have an accident in Charlo Disrahap Kamgo, I'm nine placard, I'm ten logan, I'm not a city staff here. I'm staff yet now, eight plumman die finish. During the dry weather, life is normal. However, the Gaunagadi residents are left with anxiety when the wet weather comes around. They experience flooding as drainage was poorly done during the construction of the road. And if NCDC is not doing anything, after two months or one month time, we will get our lawyer. And we will go to court. We have every evidence and facts to present before the court. The residents have put up with the floods, sewage backflows and the recent car accidents into the yards. They say the road has helped a lot in traffic congestion. However, it has dramatically changed the way they live during wet weather. In uh, living conditions, this is, not, this is inhuman. And it's a complete negligence to the contractors and the engineers who have designed and constructed this road. Authorities at City Hall have confirmed receiving letters from Gaunagadi residents, however no specific answers were given to address the issues being faced. Jack Lopava Jr. National MTV News. A small tour operator in Pomio says the district has lots to offer but is not promoted enough. Igi Matapia has been running a small guest house and tour business for 10 years. Tourist numbers have been irregular but he says Pomio has a lot more to offer. 
This is kayaking in Pomio. It is one of the many attractions that bring international tourists and adventure seekers to this remote district in the East New Britain province. For many of the tourists, the man who makes it happen on the ground is Iggy Matapia, small guest house owner who has developed good relationships with many tourists who come here. Uh, we have researched scientist tourists. Na, now all uh, all land yachts. We also I had two yachts even come to Chile in Montero. Uh, and uh, all cruise ship we also come in. Iggy built his Delawin guest house over a period of seven years. It was a long struggle to establish himself both as a guest house owner and a tour operator. Sadlo, it's in Britain. I got plenty up. Like in Kokopo, Rabaul, and uh, uh, Gesell, uh, only been promoting Finnish, but Pomio am he hated. There's an end in sight. With man, limited like internet connectivity, things. promoting tourism is difficult. But he says Pomio has places that remain largely undiscovered by outsiders. Uh, plenty long, only still, only no. All tourists in well on it. With little government support, Iggy hopes to expand when communications becomes better and good infrastructure is built. But for now, the tourists still keep coming, but in small numbers. Scott Wade, National MTV News. The Stanfield Road in Kaviang will undergo a major upgrade. This stretch of road is from the Kaviang Airport to the Beachfront War Memorial. New Island Governor Sir Julius Chan visited the first phase of the road upgrade, of which 400 metres was graded by contractor SJC. The 1.23-kilometre road development will require the realignment of power lines, water mains, communication lines and realigning of the correctional services perimeter fencing. The upgrading of this road will come in two phases. This is Tuesday's news. We'll have more of the day's news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. National Planning and Monitoring Minister Richard Maru urged all public servants in PNG to register themselves with the Civil Registry Office and it is a must for them to have a national identity card. He said this yesterday in Juwaka province after officially opening a new NID office in Bund Town. Minister Maru also appealed to ordinary citizens to register themselves to access government services. Minister Maru said all public servants must register themselves to be on the national payroll system. He gave 12 months for public servants to get registered. Mr. Maru warned them that no NID card means no pay. He further explained that there are too many ghost names on the national payroll system and to solve these and similar issues, having a NID card is the answer. Planning for the diamond, the ghost man, the payroll government, where's the planning money? So let me talk to you public service now. At the opening of the new NID office, Minister Maru explained to the people of Jiwaka province that the office will collect data of deaths, births, adoptions and marriages, while at the same time registering and issuing NID cards and certificates. Minister Maru said for better planning, the national government needs to know the exact population of our people. He said PNG cannot fail anymore in the next national census in year 2020. I plan next three years. Every citizen, public servant, man, no place, labun, no place, must get ID. No ID, no election, you know, can come lousy, no bank service, nothing. Registrar General Michael Kumung, who also attended the opening, encouraged the public to register to be able to access government services. The national government also needs to know the exact population of a district or province so that funds can be allocated according to the population registered under NID. Information system 
Minister Maru was in Juwaka province for two days for the opening and to assess developments in the new province to report back to the cabinet of its progress. His next visit will be to Hela, Southern Highlands, Western Province and Bougainville. Those who attended the ceremony yesterday were Jiwaka Governor Dr. William Tongap, South Wagi MP Joe Kuli and other dignitaries. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Former Morbe Governors Luther Wenge and Kelly Naru have both condemned the actions of Governor Saunu's men in assaulting a senior journalist in Lay. Mr. Wenge is calling for Ginsen Saunu to make his stand known whether or not he condones the actions of his officers and supporters. Since the incident last week Friday, Governor Saunu has not made any statements. <laughs> Former Governor Kelly Naru said the actions taken by the governor's men is uncalled for and an explanation must be given by the governor. Mr. Naru said the attack on a journalist is an attack to media freedom in the province. I condemn in the strongest possible terms the actions from the offices of the current governor of Morobe. Luther Wenge, who was governor for 15 years, has also made a statement saying that the integrity of the province's highest office must be protected. Reason, you must make sure that the officers who come to work in that office must be told the importance of that office. Mr. Wenge said the approach taken by the officers was not right. Well, attacking this kind of person is, is totally uncalled for. It's totally uncalled for. It's a criminal act. Last week, Friday, Frankie Kapin, a senior journalist from Post Courier's Lay Bureau, was assaulted by the governor's offices over media reports they said were negative against the governor. Threats were also issued against specific members of the lay media during the assault. After learning of the incident up at the up, we we gather together and stand in solidarity to show our <coughs> disappointment at the manner in which uh, the, what the highest office in Morwe province uh, can come, come down and deal with the uh, media in such a manner. Both leaders have called on the Morabe governor Ginsen Saono to explain and apologize for his men's actions and also to make his stance known on the incident. But governor must come forward and say that he did, if he doesn't approve, he must say that he doesn't approve and this is a certain administrative action is going to take place so that people will know that the leader has disapproved this action. Four men who were involved in the attack were charged for assault and drunk and disorderly behavior but were let out on bail. They will appear at the Lay District Court tomorrow. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. Former Morabe Governor Kelly Naru has denied claims that he was paying members of the media in Lay. These allegations were made during the assault of a senior Lay-based journalist last week by the Morabe governor's offices. The governor's offices accused Naru of having members of the media on his payroll. We are not in the business of paying journalists to basically cover our stories. That is a total lie. And this kind of statement coming from officers of the governor is totally unacceptable. The media is supposed to be an impartial organization. Hakwange Primary School in Menyamia District, Morbe, has only received 170,000 kina of tuition fee-free funds to operate last year. More than 30,000 kina is yet to be paid by the government. The school's former head teacher and now the head teacher for Milford Haven Primary School, John Aguse, said the TFF money has assisted the school's operation. However, he said the education department should adjust their timing in paying schools on time without delay. The former head teacher for Hakwange Primary School in Menyamia District, John Aguse said the TFF payment for the school arrived very late last year 
When school's account was closed, Agus has said the school has received 170,000 kina of TFF payment last year. The government is yet to pay the school more than 30,000 kina. Sometimes that does not come on time, so we, we have a problem with that. But it is, it is uh, uh, that that department should adjust and give the money on time so that we can be able to uh, work with the time. The TFF funds are supposed to be distributed as per ministry policy statement at the beginning of each academic year. This includes the three components of the TFF education policy of cash administration, infrastructure and teaching and learning materials. The former head teachers said the tuition fee-free funds should be paid to school on time to help schools, especially in rural areas, continue to operate. Enrollment came in. A lot of schools from level 3, level 4, they all rise up to level 6, level, level 5 and even level 7 in the rural area. And I really like that the TFF to continue. But one thing about it is uh, the TFF uh, paying out is very late. The government says it doesn't owe any schools outstanding in TFF payment. But six primary schools in Lake District has come forward saying the government still owe them more than 3 million kina outstanding in TFF payments. And Lay Secondary School is still waiting for the TFF outstanding payment of more than 600,000 kina. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. You at National MTV News. Chukai Sports is up next. Stay tuned for all the action when we come back. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. With the Commonwealth Games two months away and following the recent Australian Commonwealth Games trial, PNG Athletics Union has already identified seven athletes, two females and five males, that will represent PNG at the Games. All participating in their respective track and field event, athletics will be represented by two women and seven men athletes at this year's Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. Triple gold medalist from the Pacific Games, Rayleigh Caputin, will contest the long jump and triple jump, whereas young Afure Ada will run the 100 meters and 200 meter sprints. Nesmi Lee Marai, who won the 100 meters and 200 meters at the recent Pacific Mini Games, will compete in two events along with his teammate Wesley Logorava. National 200 meter record holder Tio Pinia will run in the 200 meters and 400 meters, while young Ephraim Lekin will contest the 400 meters and 400 meter hurdles. 38 year old Moen Boino will be competing at his fifth Commonwealth Games and will run the 400 meter hurdles, an event in which he has been undefeated in Pacific Games competition since 1999. Pinial is the national PNG record holder in both long jump and triple jump. Richard will contest both of these events at the Games and De Bono Paraka will be competing in the discus throw and shot put who is also the national record holder in these events. The team will be steer-headed by coach Philip Newton and West New Britain-based Wilson Malana as the assistant coach with Nola Penny as the team manager as Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Following a high finish last year as the champions of the Queensland Interest Super Cup and later their strong presence in their pool in the Rugby League World Cup, PNG's elite Rugby League players will be put to the test again when they take on NRL's Brisbane Broncos this Saturday. The Broncos, on the other hand, are expected to show no mercy as they will be arriving here in Port Moresby on Thursday in full force. With an enormous support base that extends even before the formation of the PNG Hunters, the Brisbane Broncos will have as much support as the home team here at the National Football Stadium on Saturday. With this being the final hit out before the annual season kicks off, they are expected to be more than ready for this final warm-up match. 
Meanwhile, the SPPNG Hunters just launched their season last week, with the Injury Super Cup season due to kick off in a few weeks' time. And going up against NRL Powerhouse Broncos is expected to be a good kickstart going into the 2018 season. With the Bronx lineup having the likes of Sam Tide, Cody Nikorima, and a surprise inclusion of Anthony Milford, who is returning from a shoulder surgery, the Hunters will not be taking this warm up match lightly. And as any other Hunters match, NFS will be packed. But to have Broncos as well in the stadium, let alone play at NFS, there will no doubt be a sellout crowd. No problem. Dinero Sreko, National MTV Sports. You're with Chukai Sports. We'll have more when we come back. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Trukai Sports. Turning to overseas sports, one of the best players in American football has made a surprise visit to the Blues Super Rugby team. Seattle Seahawks defense star Michael Bennett visited to learn more about rugby's tackling new techniques. It's not often an outsider stops the Blues in their tracks. Today, though, the hulking frame of NFL star Michael Bennett did just that. What have you made of the physiques of the guys? Oh, this see, so many people that could be in the NFL. I see a lot of running backs, a lot of linebackers, a lot of defensive ends. There's a lot of fast guys that could probably, if they knew the techniques and stuff, they would be stars in the NFL just like the stars here. He knows a good footballer when he sees one. Bennett is one of the most feared defensive tackling machines in American football. On his first trip here, he's visiting his wife's Samoan relatives and wanting to see rugby firsthand, carrying on Seattle's strong links to the game. To learn how to tackle better, be better defenders, being able to be better trackers, and, and everybody in rugby is so tough. Bennett says the Seahawks try to use rugby techniques reducing concussions, placing the head to one side rather than leading with it. Everybody's trying to find a way to keep the integrity of the sport, but also be able to protect the players and the young people who are playing the sport in both rugby and both football. Michael Bennett's off-field stands have made him one of the more controversial figures in the sport. The Super Bowl winner was one of the initial national anthem protesters last year. I want to stand to everybody has freedom on the things that America is built on. He also made a stand after being arrested last year under what he described as excessive force. He was then released by Las Vegas police. Bennett's a bruising tackler in his sport, but... All the guys got the, the ears all messed up and stuff, and I'm like, man, look like they're doing MMA out there, but it's fun to watch the guys go through all the stuff and see how tough they are. You probably won't see him then in this jersey on Friday night in Dunedin, but he will be watching. And to AFL, Collingwood drink driver Jordan DeGay was back at Magpie headquarters today for the official team photo. The 21-year-old is having a hard time staying out of the spotlight with his management forced to defend claims he did a wrong thing by a landlord. Eating an ice cream, DeGoey was ice cool at Collingwood for the team photo and in no mood to talk about that drink driving charge. Jordan, is there anything briefly you could say, just with respect to the last couple of days, just by way of message to the fans or anything? Suspended for it indefinitely, Dugowie's been forced to defend new claims tonight, involving his dog damaging his previous apartment. In a statement to Seven News, his manager told us Dugowie left it messy, has since apologised and worked with the agent to pay for it, suggesting it's a beat-up story on a 21-year-old who's made a mistake and owns it. Enough is enough. Darcy Moore's manager, Liam Pickering, has indicated talks on the defender's contract have only just started. Yeah, there's no great rush on this one. I mean, Darcy's trying to get himself back from his foot. But Seven News understands the Pies do have an offer on the table, incentive-based, worth as much as $600,000. But sources suggest Moore will hold out for as much as 800000 And still on Collingwood, Seven News can reveal Travis Varco has recently agreed to a one-year extension. The Pies to announce the new contract in coming days. It'll be music to his ears. Collingwood posting this video, Varco spending spare time at the club practicing guitar. Footy sources continue to insist Rory Sloan's a massive chance to return to Victoria. The Crows scoffing at suggestions they'll offer him the captaincy to stay. Uh, I'm not sure, mate, but uh, Tex has done a fantastic job so far in the last couple of years, and um, you know the boys love playing under him. So we'll see what happens. Western Bulldogs says the loss of their captain, Cardi Brandon, to injury has taken an emotional toll on their players. Both 
The Bulldogs and the Blues head into this weekend's inaugural Pride game without their skippers who have both suffered long-term injuries. It is um, quite emotional for some girls. Um, a few of us struggled over the last few weeks, but we've really rallied as a group. Um, we've connected over those injuries. Blue star forward Darcy Vessio designed Carlton's rainbow jumper. To cricket, Australian T20 captain David Warner says his team couldn't be more confident heading into tomorrow night's tri-series against New Zealand. The unbeaten Aussies are looking forward to the short boundaries of Eden Park. I couldn't be any more excited and happy um, where we are at the moment. You know, the guys are flying and they're, you know, they've got big smiles on their faces and they're, they're loving playing cricket for Australia. Meanwhile, after copping a barrage of abuse from the locals in South Africa, the Australian Test Squad enjoyed visiting sick children in hospital in Johannesburg. I haven't really had too much positive uh, feedback from the South Africans walking around the streets so far, so it's nice to see some uh, Australian shirts out there and hopefully we've got a few more fans today. The Proteas have suffered a huge blow with paceman Dale Stane ruled out of the first two tests, which start Thursday week. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports for tonight. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow, in the southern region, evening shower or two in Port Moresby, showers in Daru, Alutau and Popondeta, and cloudy periods in Kerama. In the Mombasa region, cloudy periods in Leh, fine weather in Medang, Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine apart from brief showers in Loringa, showers in Kavieng, and a shower or two in Kokopo, Rabao, Kimbe, and Buka. And in the Highlands region, cloudy with morning fog all across the region in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi, and Wabeg. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Before we go, a recap of our main stories tonight. NCD police still trying to establish motive for supermarket shootout, security in NCD to be heightened with first official APEC meet and Pomio district and its tourism potential. And that's the new sports and weather for Tuesday, February 20th, 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>